All right, hello guys, welcome to my channel. So, as you know, we studied about the protein primary structure, studied about the protein basics. So now we'll go for the proteins. Secondary structure, right? So the term secondary structure refers to the any chosen segment of a polypeptide chain and that describes the local spatial arrangement of its main chain atoms without regard to the positioning of its side chain or its relationship to the other segments. So it just refers to the any chosen segment of a polypeptide chain. So in a regular secondary structure what happens occurs when each dihedral angle if you remember that we studied in primary structure so the each dihedral angle that is the phi and the psi the phi and the psi remains the same or nearly same throughout that segment that refers to the secondary structure right and there are few types of secondary structures that are particularly stable and occur widely in protein all right so the most prominent so which are those so the most prominent are alpha helix if you remember the cell membrane that we studied the transmembrane protein so the structure that we'll discuss that was the alpha helix and then there is another type that is beta conformations and that's one more type and there are like another common type as well but it does not often be seen so that is beta turn right so this these are the most prominent one that are coming in the protein that are that occur widely in the right and when this this regular pattern are not found the secondary structure is sometimes referred to as just an undefined or a random coil right so we'll study now about this alpha helix all right we'll study about this alpha helix so just to go through a historical path of this alpha helix how it comes it is not so important but just for the knowledge of if you if you are interested in knowing the history how it goes so if you remember the linus pauling and fabric cory so the pauling and cory were aware of the importance of the hydrogen bonds in orienting polar chemical groups such as the carbon to oxygen all right or nitrogen to hydrogen groups of the peptide bond so they are aware of this orienting the carbon to oxygen and nitrogen to hydrogen group of the peptide bond but there are also experimental studies uh, that shows the results of william asbury so that was in around 1930s so that had conducted a pioneering x-ray studies of the protein so what asbury demonstrated that the protein that makes up a hair and a porcupine quills has a regular structure that repeats every so he showed in the x-ray that the protein structure that makes up a hair or the porcupine quill has a regular structure that repeat every 5.15 Armstrong, right? 5.15 to 5.2 almost, right? Or repeats every 5.15 to 5.2 Armstrong. So you, if you re remember, that's an Armstrong. Uh, sign named after the physicist that discovered this Anders J. Armstrong is equal this uh, for this one Armstrong is almost equal to 0.1 nanometers right so so this is not an SI unit it's a standard unit but in it is just like a structural biologist use this atomic to describe the atomic distances that is approximately the length of this uh, one carbon to hydrogen bond. So with this information that Asbury showed the data on the peptide bond and with the help of this precisely constructed models, Pauling and Corey set out, a determine, determine, set out to determine the likely conformation of protein molecules. So, but the first breakthrough was in around 1948. When Pauling was a visiting lecturer in the Oxford University so during that time he developed a model and later confirmed in a work with Corey and a co-worker Herman Branson was the simplest arrangement of polypeptide chain can assume that maximizes the use of internal hydrogen bonding. So which 
what was the, what was the simplest arrangement that they discover it's the helical structure this that's the helical structure and they named Pauling and Corey called this alpha helix Pauling and Corey called this alpha helix right so in this structure as we know the polypeptide backbone is tightly wound around an imaginary axis drawn longitudinally through the middle of the helix and the R group of the amino acid residue protrude outward from the helical backbone. So the Pauling and Corey considered both right and the left handed variants of this alpha helix. Right when we study the transmembrane protein, so we'll just draw a simple diagram of this helix. So this is how just a single helix will be look like. Not exactly like this, but but you can see a picture on your screen so that disc that shows the left-handed and the right-handed alpha helix so how it is determined so simple method that whether a helical structure is right-handed or left-handed so when you make a fist of your two hands so that is shown as you with the thumb outstretched and pointing away from you looking at your right hand think of a helical spiraling from the right thumb in the direction which the other four fingers are curled so in this direction, right? So it would be clockwise, right? And the resulting helix is right-handed helix, the same as for the left-handed helix, right? So these are the two helical structure that Pauling and Corey considered for the variance of alpha helix. Right? So the subsequent elucidation of the three-dimensional structure of myoglobin or other proteins showed that the right-handed helix a right-handed alpha helix is more common. Right-handed alpha helix is more common, right? And the extended left-handed alpha helices are theoretically less stable and have not been observed in many proteins. So the alpha helix proved to be the predominant structure in the alpha keratin. So this alpha helix is a predominant structure in alpha keratin that's a protein that are found in hair wool or nails or the porcupine quill so now the question arises like the why does the alpha helix form more readily than any other possible conformation or any other possible structure so the answer lies in the part and its optimal use of the internal hydrogen helical bond so we'll see how it does you can see on your screen so if you see the picture clearly so it stabilizes so the how the structure stabilizes so there is a hydrogen bond between the hydrogen atom as you can see on your screen that attaches to the electronegative nitrogen atom of a peptide linkage and there is an electronegative carbon oxygen atom of the fourth amino acid on the amino terminal side of that peptide bond so there is a hydrogen bond linkage so the hydrogen atom that attaches to the electronegative nitrogen atom and also there is an hydrogen atom that is attaching the electronegative carbonyl of an oxygen atom so this is the bond that is making when this structure forms so there is there is this bond that's an hydrogen bond that's formed between the electronegative nitrogen atom and the electronegative carbonyl ox carbonyl of oxygen atom so in in this helix within this helix every peptide bond that is passing here every peptide bond is participating in such hydrogen bonds right so within this helix every peptide bond every peptide bond participates in the participates in the hydrogen hydrogen bonding right right so the, for example this is so this will be all the hydrogen bonds that are forming except these two terminals right so at the end of this alpha helical segment there are there are always three or four amide or carbonyl group uh, or amino groups that cannot participating in this helical pattern of hydrogen bonding and this may be exposed to the surrounding solvent where the hydrogen bond 
with the water. So for example, this is in the water. Like this is water. So it forms hydrogen bond with water. All right, or other parts of the protein that may cap the helix to provide the needed hydrogen bonding patterns or sorry, partners. So there have been more experiments as well that shows that the alpha helix can form in polypeptide consisting of either L or D amino acid. And however, all the residues must be of the stereoisomeric series that we studied uh, when we studied the primary structure, all the amino acids. And a D amino acid will disrupt a regular structure consisting of L amino acids and vice versa if there is an L amino acid. So that will dis disrupt a regular structure of D amino acid. Right? And not all polypeptide, uh, not all polypeptides can form a stable alpha helix. So each amino acid residues in a polypeptide has an intrinsic propensity to form an alpha helix. Right? So the LN9 shows the greatest tendency to form alpha helices in most experimental model system. So now the position of amino acid residues also relative to its neighbor is also very important. Why? Because the interaction with the between the amino acid side chains can stabilize or destabilize the helical structure. So another point is amino acid side chain can also destabilize the alpha helical structure right so how so for example if a polypeptide chain has a long block of GLU so that's a glutamic acid residue so this segment of chain will not form an alpha helix at pH 7 and so why this glutamic acid will not form the alpha helical structure so I will just draw the structure of glutamic acid so you will understand more clearly okay so this is just a single bond because it goes with the hydrogen right so then this is CH2 and there's the carbon that's the amino group then there is this hydrogen and there is this another carboxyl group so this is negative and this is also negatively charged but there's a segment chain of the glutamic acid will not form an alpha helical structure because the negatively charged carboxyl group of adjacent glutamic acid residues so when there is like this alpha helical structure so this both will have the negatively charged so the first uh, glutamic acid residue and then the second glutamic residue will be in the line and both will have this negative both both are negatively charged so the second one will be like for example this is here so this is the r r here for the glutamic acid and there will be the another for example the side chain and this will both repel each other because of the negatively charged carboxylic and that it will repel so strongly that that will prevent the formation of alpha helix so for the same reason so there are if there are many adjacent uh, lysine or arginine uh, arginine residues with the positively charged r groups at ph7 they also repel each other and prevent the formation of alpha helix twist of an alpha helical structure ensures that the critical interaction occurs between an amino acid side chain and the side chain three residues away on the either side of it. So this is made clear when the alpha helix is depicted as in helical will, as you can see this in the picture. Right? And the positively charged amino acids are found uh, three residues away from the negatively charged amino acids permitting the formation of an ion pair. So two aromatic as, uh, amino acid residues are often similarly spaced resulting in the juxtaposition stabilized by the hydrophobic effect. And there are another one as well so proline or uh, glycine so proline or glycine so this also shows the least proclivity proclivity to form an alpha helices why because in proline if you remember the nitrogen atom is a part of a rigid ring and the rotation around the nitrogen to carbon alpha 
bond is bond is not possible because if you remember the last one because there will be like a double bond forming when between the nitrogen and carbon alpha and this is why because of that double link so the pro proline residues introduce a destabilizing kink uh, in the alpha helix also there is another thing in the proline that the nitrogen atom of proline residue in a peptide linkage there has no substituent hydrogen to participate in the hydrogen bonds with other residues so for this reason proline is only rarely found in the alpha helix right so glycine occurs frequent infrequently in alpha helix for different reason like for proline like this is one reason and there is no hydrogen bonding as well for glycine so the glycine it has a more conformational flexibility than other amino acid residue polymers of glycines tend to take up coiled structure quite different from an alpha helix and there is one more factor that can affect the stability of alpha helix that is the identity of amino acid residues near the end of so this end and this end of the alpha helical segment of the polypeptide chain so what happens when a small electric dipole exists in an each peptide bond so if we know that like there is a small electric dipole that ha that ha happens in each peptide bonds right and these dipoles are aligned through the hydrogen bonds of the helix right so resulting in a net so when there is like all, all have like plus and negative charges on this electric dipoles right so there will be the whole peptide chain will have a resulting a net dipole along the helical axis that increase the as as the length of this uh, helical structure increases so the dipole the net dipole also increases right so the partial positive and the partial negative charges of the helix dipole resides on the peptide and the carbonyl groups near the amino terminal so the partial positive and the partial negative charge of this helix depends on the alpha helix of the amino terminal and the carbonyl terminal respectively so on your screen you are seeing a picture so that is showing the electrical dipole of a peptide bond and that is transmitted along all this alpha helical segment through the interchange of the hydrogen bonding right so resulting in an overall helix dipole so there will be a overall helix dipole as well so in the screen that uh, in the picture that you are seeing so the amino acid and the carbonyl constituent of each peptide bond are indicated by the positive for the amino and the carbonyl is the negative symbols right so when these dipoles are aligned through this hydrogen bonds of the helix so there will be a resulting net dipole and the partial positive and the partial negative charges that are that you are seeing in your picture of the helix dipole reside on the peptide amino and the carbonyl groups because the near the amino terminal end and the carboxyl terminal end respectively so for this reason when the negatively charged amino acids are often found near the amino terminus of the helical segment where they have a stabilizing interaction with the positive of the charge of the helix dipole and a positively charged amino acid at the amino terminal and is destabilized right for this reason like you can see in this picture so the negatively charged amino acids are often found near the amino terminus of the helical segment so that will stabilize the interaction with the positive charge of the helix dipole but if it's the negatively charged uh, amino if it's sorry the positively charged amino acid at the amino terminal so that will destabilize the whole alpha helix and the opposite is true for the carboxyl termi terminal end as well so if it's positive carboxyl terminal end will be positive at the end so the alpha helix will be stable but if it's negative the alpha helix will be there are like five types of constant that affect the alpha helical stability so the first one was intrinsic propensity of amino acid residue to form an alpha helix right there was uh, another one that was interaction between the r groups like how r groups are spaced uh, apart the three or uh, three or four residues apart and there is this that we studied how the r groups are adjacent to each other with the positive or the negative charges and there is the occurrence of the proline and the glycine residues 
and the fifth one was the interaction between the amino acid residues at the end of the helical segment with the electrical dipole with the electrical dipole so these are the few of the factors that can affect the stability of alpha helix right after this alpha helix the second one is beta conformation this one so in 1951 pauling and cori predicted this second type of repetitive structure that is this beta conformation that was this was in 1951 all right so so in this beta conformation there's a backbone of polypeptide chain is extended into an uh zigzag structure rather than so this for this beta conformation it was rather like a zigzag structure instead of this the alpha helical structure right so the arrangement of the several segment side by side so like for beta so there will be like this arrangement of several segments side by side of this beta conformation is called beta sheet so for this if it's like there are so many side by side so this will be known as beta sheet right so the zigzag structure of the individual polypeptide segment give rise to a pleated appearance of the overall sheet okay right. so when you see the zigzag structure of the individual polypeptide segment so it gives rise to a pleated appearance of the overall sheet so and the hydrogen bonds that forms between the adjacent uh, segments of the polypeptide chain within the sheet so the hydrogen bonds will form between the adjacent segment of the polypeptide chain within this sheet and the individual segments that form the beta sheet are usually nearby on the polypeptide chain but can also be quite a distance from each other in a linear sequence of the polypeptide so they may be even different polypeptide chain right so the individual segments that form this beta sheet are usually nearby on the polypeptide chain usually they are nearby but can also be a quite distance from each other uh, in the linear sequence when you say in the linear sequence of the polypeptide so they may even be in a different polypeptide chain as well so the r group of the adjacent amino acid protrude from the zigzag structure in opposite direction creating the alternative pattern seen in the side view when this is done as a side view for example and this is a side view of a beta strand so the r group is coming like this outside and for example this is this is and this will protrude like this right so in this beta strand in the side view you can notice that the r group so these are the r groups or the side chains so the r groups of adjacent amino acid protrude outside from this exact structure in the opposite directions right so on your screen you can see the two pictures so the adjacent polypeptide chain of this beta sheet can be either parallel as you can see in your picture or can be anti-parallel as well so that is having the same or opposite amino to carboxyl orientation respectively so the structure that are somewhat similar although that repeat the period is shorter for the parallel conformation right and the hydrogen bonding patterns are different so the interstrands hydrogen bond are essentially in line when you see the anti-parallel beta sheet whereas they are distorted or, or not in line in the parallel beta sheet so you can see in in your picture for the anti-parallel so the hydrogen bond are in line correct and for the parallel beta sheet the hydrogen bond that are in the uh, dashed shape uh, that are that are not in line so the last one is beta turn so this is in globular proteins which have a compact folded structure some amino acid residues are in turns or in loops where the polypeptide chain reverses the direction right for this beta turn so these are found in the globular protein right so these are the connecting elements so that links the successive runs of the alpha helix or the beta one so you can see the picture on your screen so particularly common are the beta turns that connect the ends of two adjacent segment of anti-parallel beta sheet so in the structure that you can see so the structure is so the structure is 180 degree in turn involving four amino acid residues so in your screen you can see there is a there is a four amino acid residues with the carbonyl oxygen of the first residue 
forming a hydrogen bond with the amino group hydrogen of the fourth one right so the first one with the carbonyl that forms a bond with the fourth amino hydrogen right and the peptide group of the central two residues as you can see do not participate in any interest residue hydrogen bonding so several types of beta turn have been described so each defined by the phi and the psi angles of the bond that link the four amino acid residues that make up the particular turn so even the glycine and the proline residue often occur in this beta turn as they were not occurring in this glycine and proline as they do not occur in the alpha helix so they occur in this beta turns the former because it is because the proline and the glycine is small and flexible right so the glycine and proline residue often occur in this beta turns right, right? so on your skin you are seeing the two types of beta turn that are most common and beta turns are often near the surface of the protein where the peptide group of the central two amino acid so where the, the central two amino acid on your screen that you see that do not bond right do not form hydrogen bond so that two amino acid residue in turn can hydrogen bond with the water and considerably considerably less common in the gamma turn a three residue turn with the hydrogen bond between the first and the third residue right so that was beta turn right so the alpha helix and the beta conformation are the major repetitive secondary structure in the wide variety of protein although other repetitive structure exist in some specialized protein as well that for example collagen all right so there are other repetitive structure as well and the only amino acid residue that are found in a conformation outside this region is glycine so that does not in this region is glycine because its side chain is really small and glycine residue can take part in many conformation that are sterically forbidden for or all other amino acids all right so these are the secondary structure that we studied right now right so alpha helix beta conformation and beta turn guys okay, so that was the protein secondary structure Right, thank you guys for watching we'll see you in the next video we'll study the tertiary and the quaternary structure forget to subscribe the channel thank you